So we're in this uh, left and right series uh, at the moment, the second week of left and right series. And uh, today I'm going to speak about the money, money and the economy, money and the economy. And uh, uh, just to set expectations, we're not going to fix the economy today. Um, that was the Chancellor's job on Wednesday with the budget. Um, but actually, here in the church, we don't talk about money often enough. Uh, actually, Jesus speaks about money an awful lot. Uh, there are 2,350 references to money in the Bible. And Jesus only spoke about the kingdom of God, uh, his father and faith, more than he spoke about money. And you'll see there that uh, Satan is next on the list, not quite as high up as money, uh, you'll note. More on that in a bit. And uh, Jesus, he spoke about money more than judgment, uh, spiritual authority, healing, the law and the prophets, his own death and prayer. Billy Graham said that if a person gets his attitude towards money straight, it will help straighten out almost every other area in his life. And Jesus knows this to be true. Because there are universal truths, aren't there? I mean, Jane Austen knew that there were universal truths. She uh, began Pride and Prejudice with the immortal words that it, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. She was always on the money, wasn't she? And actually, she, uh, she now quite literally is on the money. She's on the, she's on the 10 pound note. Uh, <laughs> since 2017, uh, her face has adorned the 10 pound note. And it, it, uh, along with her face, there's this quote. It says here, I declare after, not that you can read that, but I declare after all, there is no enjoyment like reading. There is no enjoyment like reading. The problem with that quote here on, on the 10 pound note is that um, that quote actually came from a character in Pride and Prejudice called Caroline Bingley. And Caroline Bingley actually isn't a bookworm. She's just interested in capturing the affections of the absolutely smoldering Mr. Darcy. <laughs> so there's a problem, isn't there? There's a problem um, when we take uh, things out of context. We take quotes out of context. There's a problem uh, with taking that out of context uh, on money. And similarly, there's a problem um, that we take the Bible out of its context too, that it loses its meaning. And I, I, I think this can particularly happen when we talk about money. And so as we look at this series on, on left uh, and right, uh, we could say on one, the one hand, like, like Maggie Thatcher, uh, that the Good Samaritan was a capitalist because he had to be wealthy in the first place. Uh, or we could say that actually the early church were all collectivists and they were socialists and communists because they shared everything they had in common. Now, the most important thing is not our own personal worldviews, but the, the way that God views the world, the way that God sees the world. What we need are, are lenses, if you like, to see the world, to see uh, the kingdom. You know, each of us, we all have our own perspectives. We have perspective, but God has perfect vision. And despite all our progress, uh, despite uh, all that's, that's happened uh, with economic thinking of Kwasi Kwarteng and, and Jeremy Corbyn, uh, believe it or not, but nobody has ever developed on the economic philosophy and the political theory of Jesus Christ. No one has ever built upon uh, the Sermon on the Mount. So let's take a look, Matthew chapter six, verse 19, where Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what's the context? What's the context? Well, Jesus, he's just taught uh, the people at the Sermon on the Mount uh, the Lord's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer which begins, Our Father. And then he says four times, do not, do not, do not, do not. Different things that could possibly take us away from the Father, take us away uh, from relationship with him. And so what we see here is when we think about God, uh, Jesus saying, Our Father in heaven, is that actually money is an identity issue. It's about our status and it's about our identity as we, as we build upon all that we've heard from, from Glenn Harrison uh, the past week. And what Jesus gives us is an eternal investment strategy. I mean, you know and I know that our money isn't safe, that our capital is at risk, that even without Bitcoin and inflation, we can't take it with us. 
John D. Rockefeller. He was uh, the richest man in the world. When he died, you know, people came up to his lawyer and said, how much did he leave? The lawyer replied, all of it. <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't take money with you. You can't take it with you. But you can send it on ahead. And what we see in, in uh, the, the verses here is that the, the root for, for treasure and storing is actually the same. So it's like Jesus is saying, um, treasure your treasures in heaven. And, and the, the tense is, is present. So it's saying, keep, go on treasuring your treasures in heaven. I, uh, I spoke a, a couple of weeks ago about valuing the, the gold that we've been given. And as we think about verse 21 uh, here, it's, it's, it's actually not what we'd expect. It's not um, where your heart is, there your treasure will follow. But it's actually where your treasure is, there your heart will follow. So here, it's actually where we invest leads to our desires. Where we invest leads to our desires. So you might wake up on a Sunday morning hypothetically and think, I don't particularly feel like going to church today. But you still come along and you invest and then you invest in your desire, you invest in your relationship with God and you open yourself up in worship and community and, and hearing God's word. You open yourself up to letting God grow his, uh, his desire in you. you know, as a family, uh, we booked uh, to, to go to the church weekend, we booked to go to Focus, and also later in the family, we've booked to go away with some friends for um, a few days of, of Christian teaching. It's quite a lot, you'd say. And uh, uh, we, this week we received this, this email. Uh, so far, you've booked in and you've paid a deposit, but we wondered if you would now like to join us in praying for the week. You could see it as a spiritual deposit or an investment in the week. Now, I don't want to fritter away my precious weeks of holiday. I want to invest in my weeks of holiday. I've paid for it, now I'm going to pray for it. You know, I'm investing in this time I'm wanting to come to things like the church weekend and focus because I, I, I care about the, tra tra the trajectory of my family's life. And will we in decades to come be seeking the kingdom first? Will we in decades to come be marked by knowing our loving Father in heaven? So it's actually investing. It's actually investing that leads to our desires. You know, how, do we, how do we let money lose its grip in our lives? It's hold and that strangling of our lives. Give it away. Give it away. And then our desires grow in the right way. But then, but then Jesus, he mixes metaphors. He, he says in verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness. We often, um, we often skip over these verses, particularly when we're talking about money, and, and actually because it's, it's a confusing verse. But what Jesus is doing here is, is, is he's linking our, our eyes to our hearts. He's linking our eyes uh, to our hearts. And in the ancient world, what they understood happened uh, with the human eye. What they understood happened. You know, you'll see here that I'm not an optician. Um, but, but, but rather than um, our eyes being like a, a window where light comes through the window into the house or like the aperture on a camera, they actually understood that, that light came from our eyes to the thing um, that we're looking at and then it comes back to us. So uh, this light is coming like a lamp, like Jesus is saying, like a lamp, and, and, and we'll look at all these different things going on out here and then what it, comes, it does, it comes back into us and then it fills our whole body, it comes into our heart. What Jesus is speaking about here is, is about how our desires come from within us. That yes, there might be all these things out there that, that, that we want, but actually we, we have this innate internal desire. And, and if, if we're not careful, these things can come in and fill our whole bodies uh, with darkness. So what Jesus is saying at this point is that actually your desires lead to how you invest your desires lead to how you invest. And Jesus here, he's talking about uh, our eyes being healthy. Healthy. And literally, uh, in, 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 in um, the, the original language, it was as if um, it, that, that it's 
it's a single and without folds, like a curtain, like a curtain that hasn't been folded. And so there's, 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 there's a lack of deception, there's a lack of deceit, there's a lack of, of, of a double agenda going on here. And we desire what we see. So what, what are we desiring? What are, what are we giving light to in our lives? Those things that, that we're looking at. What, what, what are those things? And, and is that gonna be darkness that is gonna come in and fill our heart? The atheist, uh, Frederick Nietzsche, that Glenn Harrison referred to on Wednesday, he, he said that what once was done for the love of God is now done for the love of money. That is, for the love of that which at present affords us the highest feeling of power and a good conscience. If for some of us here, the, the money that we have, it, it, can, it can make us feel like we're special. You know, I'm, I'm not like the other people. I have to do those things. You know, I'm, I'm immune. I'm separate from other people. And Tim Keller says that the, the money God's modus operandi includes blindness to your own heart. If, if, if our desire is for money and possessions and stuff and all these things, it, it can come in and, and, and fill our hearts, fill our whole being with darkness, this darkness in our hearts. And Jesus is saying, this, this is poisonous. You know, it's, it's, it's so easy to daydream, isn't it? You know, just how much easier my life would be if a million pounds just dropped into my bank account at tomorrow. And, and the call here is, is, is really a question. Are our eyes cross-eyed? Or do our eyes have focus? Are our eyes cross-eyed or are our eyes focused on the cross? Because if they're, if they're focused on the cross, then actually what Jesus can do for each one of us is to, to fill our whole being, our whole person, our, our hearts with more and more light. It's so, uh, it's so easy for us to live our lives, I think particularly in London, uh, where, where, where spinning plates all the time, spinning plates. You may have used that expression yourself. And we're just spinning plates the whole time. You know, what does my boss think of me? What do my friends think of me? What do I think of me? You know, uh, am I earning enough money? Am I on the right career trajectory? Am I getting enough likes on Instagram? All these different things. And Jesus is saying, just focus on this one thing and everything else will fall into place. Ben Rogers uh, spoke at the 8 a.m. a few weeks ago on uh, worry. And uh, he spoke about how, how when Jesus talks about worry, this really does um, come and fit into the whole area of, of, of Jesus giving the Lord's Prayer and how the Lord's Prayer begins, our Father, our Father in heaven, our loving Father who knows us and loves us. He's all powerful. He's in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Worthy of investment is your name, Jesus Christ, the Father and the Holy Spirit. Your kingdom come, your will be done. As we focus on God, as we, as we focus on the things that he's focused on, we know that he will provide. He'll provide for all our needs. He will give us our daily bread. I wonder, I wonder what it is for you. I, I'm, I'm in particular, I'm, I'm motivated by security a lot of the time. And if I was a car, I'd be a Volvo. <laughs> but it's actually, I mean, security is good to an extent, but it's actually really important that I'm trusting my loving heavenly father for all my needs, my security, my well-being. And so, so when Jesus speaks about our eyes, he, he, he's saying, well, you can have your perspective. You can have all your different perspectives. You have perspective. I have vision. And Jesus says, you can have your perspectives or you can have my vision for your life. And Jesus, he says elsewhere that our lives do, do not consist in an abundance of possessions. Jesus, he has a much, much grander plan for your life and for my life. And then he says this. He says, no one can serve two masters. So no spinning plates here. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And when Jesus says money, uh, the word he uses is the word mammon, mammon. In his book, uh, Dismissing Jesus, How We Evade the Way of the Cross, Douglas Jones writes, you cannot serve both God and mammon. 
And Jesus didn't deny that money was a God. God, That God even has a name, Mammon. Jesus affirmed Mammon as the sole serious competitor to the Trinity. And Jesus understood the antithesis or contrast between God's way and Mammon's way as the most fundamental distinction in all of life and history. He didn't divide the world into left versus right or liberal versus conservative or the envious versus the entrepreneur or Christian versus Muslim. Jesus didn't make mammon just a side temptation for a few like we do. Typical Christians tend to shrink mammon into one of many small idols. For Jesus, mammon wasn't one idol among many equals. He singled it out as the direct competitor to God. He never contrasted the idols of sexuality, of knowledge of the earth in such stark opposition to God. We wonder why Jesus talks about money more than he talks about Satan. In many of us, we think, we actually think that we can serve God and mammon. The life is like a, a dual carriageway. You've got God and mammon traveling together along side by side. But what Jesus is saying here is that life is not a dual carriageway. Life is a fork in the road. And we've got to choose which way is it going to be. Is it going to be God or is it going to be mammon? And the language that Jesus uses here is, is that of a, of a slave and a slave and a master. A slave and a master. Tim Keller says, what do, what, what do idols demand of us? That we love, that we trust, and that we obey them. Our desires and our investment. An investment that leads only ever to ever diminishing returns. You know, another bit of the Bible that's very often misquoted is, you know, Paul, Paul didn't say that, that money is the root of all kinds of evil. He actually said the, that, that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So don't love money, love God. And this is, this is, this is a challenge for all of us, all of us here in this room. You know, there are some people here in this room who are, who are astronomically wealthy, you know, by anyone's standards. And, and if we're wealthy, that makes it hard for us to depend on Jesus. Because depending on Jesus is all about trust, isn't it? And that's why Jesus says it's very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. But being wealthy puts you at a serious disadvantage for your salvation. Our very own William Wilberforce, he said that prosperity hardens the heart. He, he knew that, that, that wealth and what it was like, and he, he knew that, that it hardens you to Jesus. But, but Wilberforce, he, he won the battle over wealth in his heart. And there are some people here who, who have very little. According to data that's just come out this month, one in two people in this room will be experiencing high levels of anxiety about debt. You know, and, and, and um, there's debt that's sensible, some debt that's sensible for us to take on in our lives. And then there's also kinds of debt that just lock us in and trap us in into this awful spiral. We think about things like um, payday loans and, and, and those sorts of things. Um, actually, it's just really important that, that we get ourselves out of those situations first and foremost. And Rosie Jones recently ran um, the CAP, the Christians Against Poverty Money course uh, here at the church. And and if you hop onto CAP's website, you can find a a course that's taking place. But but, but some of us, we we don't um, have much. And and we're wondering about, you know, how how are we going to pay the bills? And so money just sort of occupies us. It actually controls our thinking the whole time. And Jesus is saying, hey, don't be controlled. Don't be controlled. Don't become a slave to mammon. We've also got to be careful about um, sort of looking to, uh, into turning into a sort of an ascetic lifestyle of simplicity and turning that into an idol. You know, we've got to be careful about not practicing our righteousness before others. Jesus talks about that in the Sermon on the Mount. He talks about the way that, that we are righteous. He talks about the way that we should do things like, like fast. And Martin Luther was actually very rude uh, about those who pursued uh, simplicity and an ascetic lifestyle, because he said it keeps you dependent on others and poverty should always be opposed. 
Now, actually, for some of us, um, uh, uh, living a life of, of radical simplicity might be our calling. It might be what God is calling us to. We just need to be careful that we don't turn that in itself and our own performance into pride as well. Because the, the purpose behind all of this is a relationship uh, with Jesus. As you see here that rich or poor, there is a danger for us in, in living lives that are of pride and prejudice. Paul writes to Timothy, but godliness with contentment is great gain. But note that he continues. He says, for we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. You know, we shouldn't feel guilty about enjoying our lives and having fun. But also, we're not called to be people that spend recklessly. As we, uh, as we think about the world, there's, there's lots of things that, that each one of us can do with our money. There's lots of things that we can do with our money is to invest our money, invest our money. You know, and, and, and if we're in debt, the, the main thing really is to get out of debt in the first place. That's, that's the first priority. But if, if every Christian in America gave a 10% of their income back to the work of God, it would eliminate world poverty three times over. Can, can, can you imagine if every follower of Jesus followed the biblical principle, uh, the line of, of, of giving 10% of, of what we have, our first fruits, back to him, back to the work of the church? Just imagine how different this world would be. And so, yes, if, if you're not yet giving to HCC and you're coming along here and, and this is what you call your church, uh, then, then please do consider setting up a, a, a direct debit to our church and, and give cheerfully, give proportionately. We, you know, we, we, we run a, a breakfast club, we run um, a Love Your Neighbor, and we think about all the different outreach activities. You know, not to mention, not to mention paying for someone's supper on Alpha. I can't think of a better use of five pounds, a better investment of five pounds than that. You know, those of you who are wealthy here today, I, I, it's not all doom and gloom. I do want to encourage you. I, I want to encourage you that, that actually um, Jesus' ministry and Paul's ministry too was, was often financed by very uh, wealthy women and they enabled the gospel to, to spread. And we saw the early church, they, they shared what they had with one another. So invest your money. Secondly, invest your talents. Invest your talents. I'm aware there's many of you here that are as civil servants, you're working in politics, you're working in economics, in finance, in banking. And I know you don't wear a cape. I, I know you can't do everything. But you can challenge systems you can challenge ways of working and being that continue to drive the wedge between the wealthiest and the poorest in our society further and further and further apart. And when you think about it, that might seem like a tall order. And, and yes, the odds might be against you. But the odds were also against William Wilberforce. They were against William Wilberforce. They were against the Clapham sect with that utterly demonic economic system of slavery. And yet God used each and every one of them. And if you think, well, what about little old me, little old me? You know, I don't work in banking. I don't work in politics. I don't work in finance. And if you think about the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus was speaking to a lot of very impoverished people, probably people that had far less than even the person here who has materially the least. And yet these people changed society. These people changed the course of history because they had a kingdom mindset. Never underestimate what God can do through you and me when we have his vision, when we have this treasure in jars of clay. At our Wednesday staff meeting a week ago, uh, our operations director, Joe Watling, uh, spoke to us on um, how to manage budgets, how to manage budgets. The strangest, the strangest thing happened. Um, I got a little choked up, uh, and a tear fell from my eye. 
And it wasn't uh, because she was telling us about spreadsheets. Actually, thankfully, uh, she was telling us about a parable that Jesus tells, where there's a manager who goes away, and uh, you have one servant, and, and, and they're entrusted with, with pots of gold. And this is one servant who takes the wealth that he's been given, and he keeps it to himself. He buries it in the ground. And then there's one servant who's given two bags of gold, and there's another servant who, who gets five bags of gold. And the, the, the servant who had two and five, when the master manager returned, they'd both doubled what they'd been given. You know, I, I believe that each and every one of us here, we have desires for great things. And each and every one of us, we have the opportunity to see Jesus face to face to see him look us in the eyes and say, well done, good and faithful servant. I've given you small things. Now I'm going to entrust you with many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The desires that we have for our lives. Jesus has plans. He has dreams. He has visions for our lives that are far, far greater than anything that we're expecting. Are we stewarding the riches that Jesus has given us? You know, remember the the, the rich young ruler, the rich young ruler who, who walked away from Jesus. He walked away from Jesus because he'd put his riches above Jesus Christ. He'd put his ability to fulfill the law above a relationship with Jesus Christ. It was his pride that was stopping him, his brilliance and his money. And the poor know, the poor know that life's not quite as simple as that. That there are actually forces going on that are beyond our control. That we are weaker than we realize. And, and, and as for money, it can all too easily just slip through our fingers. You know, the poor aren't deluded by wealth in the way um, that it blinds us to our own need. But Mark says, Mark says that, that Jesus, he looked at this rich young man And he loved him. He loved him. And that's exactly the way that Jesus looks at you and me this morning. That Jesus' desire for you and me led to his investment. It was because he loved us that though he was rich, he became poor for you and me. Jesus, he is the image of the Father in heaven who looks at us and loves us, who for Jesus, the cost of living was dying. And he was the rich young ruler who for the joy set before him endured the cross. And he invested so that he might receive what he desired. Paul writes in Ephesians, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. The eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. It's amazing, it's amazing that that Jesus, he keeps treasuring the treasure that he sees in you and me. Will we go on treasuring and trusting the treasure that we see in Jesus Christ.